Another good day to everybody. Uh, another daily devotions, and this is June thirteenth. And today we finish up the book of Job, chapters forty uh, through forty-two. So we finished uh, with uh, the first response that God gives to Job, uh, and suggesting that Job just does not understand and is not capable of understanding the creation that God Himself has put in place and cared for. And we begin in chapter 40, where Job, Job responds to that. And Job uh, says that he now understands he's unworthy in comparison to God and says that having spoken before when he had no right, that he will now keep silent. Um, <clears throat> and uh, notwithstanding Job's admission of unworthiness, God's not done yet. God continues to speak. Uh, and uh, so that's what happens beginning in chapter 40, verse 6. God begins his second speech, and it begins uh, with words familiar uh, to his first speech, but then raises the stakes by daring Job to make himself as powerful and majestic as God so that he is able to bring low the proud. In other words, in the first speech, what God is doing is questioning Job's wisdom now he's daring Job to say, see if you can do what I do. See if you can create and care the way I do. Um, and so uh, I guess you could say God ups the ante here. And so um, having dared Job to vanquish the proud, uh, God describes uh, the archetypes of the powerful creatures of the ancient Near East, the behemoth and the Leviathan. Now, it's hard to know completely what's being talked about here. Uh, there are many scholars who believe the behemoth is a reference uh, to the hippopotamus, which is a very uh, powerful beast. Uh, and actually, um, uh, we, we, see, we always see them laying in the water if we're in the zoo, or, and they just look like they're just lumbering and slow. But actually, a hippopotamus is... Uh, one of the faster creatures in Africa, that if it gets a running start, uh, it's hard to get away from, and it's powerful. And uh, so the behemoth could be the hippopotamus. The leviathan could be the whale, um, but, some, but there are places in the Old Testament where it seems to refer to the crocodile, uh, which of course is uh, more aggressive than alligators and uh, are very deadly if uh, you get too close to them. And by the way, they too move very quickly uh, on land. Uh, so it, it could be, so these are, when you think about these two creatures, they're very powerful, they're very deadly, they're hard to control. Uh, now, some have suggested that actually these may be just more mythical creatures. These may be an exaggerated form of large animals. So uh, in our world, think of Godzilla and King Kong. That's not the way it would have been thought of by them, but just think of that. So there can, there's sort of could be a mythic nature, a mythic exaggerated nature, but the point simply is the most powerful creatures of creation, Job, can you, can you deal with them? Can you tame them? Can you control them is basically what God is saying. Um, and uh, so, uh, Job's, Job knows what the answer is, as God uh, uh, doubles down on this. And so Job uh, recognizes this, and he recognizes that God is beyond human comprehension, that the world is not run uh, by human rules of order or of moral justice. Um, and uh, he admits that he spoke before uh, from a lack of knowledge, lack of and wisdom, knowledge and wisdom are not the same. Uh, they're connected, but not the same. But, he but here he speaks of a lack of knowledge, which also reveals his lack of wisdom. Uh, but now after this theophany, this appearance of God, he has a deeper, more direct understanding of God, not just through hearing from him, perhaps hearing through traditional teaching, but through seeing. That is experiencing God firsthand. This is not 
the seeing here is not actually God, uh, Job sees God, but he gets to experience God in this theophany firsthand, and uh, he realizes um, he's definitely spoken out of turn. So now Job has a greater understanding. The tensions uh, that have uh, uh, been presented through the book are gone. Job sees the world now differently. It's the world is not neatly divided into good and evil or righteousness and sin, but rather it's a world uh, in which, which is a mixture of so many things, order and chaos and suffering, wholeness and suffering as well. And all of these remain under God's watchful eye. Job suffers not because he sinned. But because he, not because he sinned, but because he lives in a broken world, an imperfect world. And uh, so uh, the simplistic understanding of uh, sin and face calamity or do well and uh, enjoy prosperity is a doctrine here that is repudiated. Now, what's interesting now is we get the epilogue in 42.7. And so uh, we've, we've been, you know, we had the prose narrative, the introduction that was prose, right, setting the stage. And then it goes into poetry throughout. Now it ends in prose again. And this is the end. Um, and uh, God certainly deems Job as correct and his friends incorrect. And what that means is um, not is that Job is honest about the situation, not, not uh, uh, wanting to connect his specific doings to his calamity, whereas his friends did. So his friends, his friends are the ones who are wrong here. Um, but what's interesting is, even though you get this uh, affirmation that the uh, uh, Sin and disobedience lead to calamity, and uh, faithfulness lead necessarily lead to prosperity. Uh, you get exactly you get exactly that at the end. Job is restored. He gets a new family, which is interesting. That that modern we modern readers sort of bat you know uh, bat 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 our eyes at that. Uh, not sure why now that after all of this, Job gets a new family back, like new and improved, and he gets an inheritance. He lives 140 years, um, which, uh, if you read Psalm 90, is twice the natural lifetime of 70 years, and uh, he gets long life, and he gets progeny, all these traditional rewards for piety and wisdom, and so the book ends with Job living happily ever after and seems to undermine what God has been saying in the speeches um, is that the, the faithful life does not always necessarily lead to prosperity and good things. So, but that's where the book ends. Um, it may also be that the, uh, this epilogue is added later to try to have an ending to the story and uh, to sort of have it land, have the plane land at the airport, so to speak, uh, instead of having Job responding to God saying that God is right and he is wrong. But that's how the story ends. So, I mean, it's a good book. It, it, it's repetitive, as we've talked about, but it's a book that really uh, probes in a poetic and, and narrative fashion uh, the problem of pain and suffering in the world and how that connects or doesn't connect to how we behave and live. Uh, these, are, these are questions we still act to ask today. Um, I think that the biggest question, uh, the, the most pressing questions that people have today in the modern Western world is why is there suffering? And if there is a God, why does God allow such suffering? Um, and I think we can provide some rather satisfying logical answers to that concern. But we must always remember that when you're in the midst of the suffering, when you're in the midst of the pain, 
when it's other people who are suffering, who you, whom you love and care about, those rational answers just aren't sufficient. What that's insufficient, what is sufficient is to do exactly what Job's friends did first before they started talking. And that is sit with him in silence and just mourn with him as a presence. Sometimes silence indeed uh, provides communication in a way that no words ever can. So that's it for Job. Tomorrow we begin with the Psalms. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your presence with us, that you care for us in all circumstances. And may we always be mindful that we can be your presence to others in the midst of their pain and suffering. Help us to be willing to enter into that suffering in order that not that we would provide them with any kinds of profound answers to their struggles, but that we would just be there and be a suffering presence with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, tomorrow it is.